Tonight we have the honor of welcoming Lauren Booth, who is a journalist. She's a broadcaster who currently has two programs, both on Palestine. One is called Remember Palestine. She has another pro program she presents called The Dysphoria, or The Diaspora. Yes. Diaspora. Yes. I <laughs> that wrong. Yes. <laughs> it's about time. She suffered the fool. Thank you. The Diaspora. Lauren has visited the West Bank and Gaza as a journalist and an activist. As a result, she accepted Islam in 2010. It's my honor, it's my privilege to introduce Sister Lauren Booth, and this is her story. Allahu Akbar. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful, I wish you a salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And thank you so much for all you've helped us to do um, for your community and the Umrah in America uh, via the Muslim Legal Fund. And I'm here tonight to talk about my journey to Islam. Because believe me, there is not one of you sitting here who is more surprised than me at the way I'm dressed right now. Because two years ago, I was not this person. I was such a different person. I could not have imagined myself, in fact, two years ago, if I had walked into the masjid now and seen myself in this hijab, with this abaya, I would have done something like, no way. <laughs> what did they do to you? Because you see, I wasn't going to be Muslim. I wasn't searching for anything. I didn't need any answers in my life. I, I was what you could call a happy sinner. But something happened to me, for which I will be eternally grateful. And I want to take you on that journey tonight, inshallah. Because we know when we hear reversion stories that it renews our own faith. That we get to see the hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moving invisibly and perhaps we remember to feel him in our own lives. And we recognize him talking to us as well about each of our deen. So people say, were you religious when you were a child? What sort of household did you grow up in? Well, I grew up in the 1970s in London. Broadly speaking, my parents were Christian. My father was an actor, and he was a Catholic. But he was a lapsed Catholic. What does that mean? Well, it means that when he was drunk, he sang Catholic songs. <laughs> that was his face. And then my mother was uh, a superstitious Christian. So she would never go to church with us and she'd never pray, but she liked to have crosses hanging around the house to ward off evil spirits. That was her version of Christianity. So into this household I was born, and I always remember praying as a child. I've thought about this long and hard, and I can go back to maybe four, four years old when I would put my hands together before bedtime and I'd say the words, Dear God. Often when we're little, our prayers are very simple, they're very sweet. I remember making one particular prayer a lot. And it went like this. Dear God, please take my sister Emma away. <laughs> she was a very difficult child. No one had to tell me that God showed my parents and told my parents and my grandparents what to do and that reflected on my life. I just knew it. And as Muslims, this is explained to us. We have fitbah. It's put into us the understanding of our Creator when we are in the wombs of our mother. But it's not easy in the secular West to hold on to the rope of Iman, is it? You'll see with your own children that they may start off strong and you talk to them about faith and somehow that rope becomes slippery as you get older. So when I, by the time I was 10, my friends were mocking me. A girl would come over from school and have a sleepover and when I went, dear God, please make... She'd say, what are you doing? And my friends would make that sound that children make, you know? Oh, you're praying. Oh, 
oh yeah, to the invisible man. The guy on the clouds with the big white beard, yeah? That Santa Claus, children don't like being mocked. They're very sensitive. And then of course, when you hit 12 or 13, your own arrogance reaches new peaks and your confusion and your nafs, and then gradually your passion. And so guess what? By the time I was 13, I had pushed God to the corner of a universe. He was there and I was here. And I started to drink alcohol. Around 16, I started to take drugs. And then it was a slippery slope into the rest of whatever modern life has to offer. And I wasn't different from my peers. So what did I know about Islam growing up? Well, I can't say it figured very large in my childhood, growing up in North London. But there were three Muslim girls in my year at school. And I watched them, I observed them, and I tried to understand about Islam from that. And I drew three conclusions by the time I was 17 about Islam. One, all Muslim girls have black, shiny hair. Two, all Muslim girls are very good at maths and are going to be doctors. Three, Islam comes from Pakistan. Up until 9-11, that was all the knowledge that I had or thought I had about Islam. I feel a lot worse about that, but I think that's actually more than the average American knows. What we want to know when somebody comes to Islam is this. What was the single moment when your life changed? What was the moment when the light bulb went bing and you felt Allah in your life guiding you? Now I've thought about this long and hard and it always comes down to the same point and I'd like to share it with you now. In the year 2000, in December, I was sitting at home watching TV, the nightly news. I had a one-month-old baby called Alexandra, the same little girl who's here today. But she was a newborn in 2000. And while I was watching the evening news, there was a package from a place called Israel, and some Palestinian people seemed to have an argument about it and an image came on my screen that felt like I'd been punched in the stomach when I saw it. It was of a boy. His name was Faris Oden. And all you could see was his back. But his back took my breath away. He was wearing jeans, he had a t-shirt on, and in his right hand, he had a stone. And Faris Ode was standing something like this. And there was such power in that back and such might in that stone that it amazed me and I stared at my TV screen. Because just a few feet from this boy was an Israeli tank. And the tank was pointing its gun directly at him and the boy clearly had no fear. I felt admiration for him. I felt respect for him, but that's not what the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, wanted me to feel. Because they were telling me, trying to make me think that that young boy was a terrorist. He was a danger, somehow, to my freedom, and that tank, that lovely, good, friendly Israeli tank, pointing its gun at a child, was my friend. But sitting in my comfortable home, I didn't feel that. And I had no idea at that moment how much Palestine and Israel would come to play a part in my life. Like what? That boy was 15 years old and I didn't know it, but nine days later he was shot in the neck by an Israeli sniper and he bled to death on the ground in a place I'd never heard of called Rafa. In a place I'd never heard of called the Gaza Strip. Well, that photograph is the only explanation I can give for what happened next, brothers and sisters. Because a whole five years passed in which I had another baby, and in 2005, 
In December, I went into my editor's office at the Mail on Sunday newspaper. And I heard myself say some very peculiar words. And this is what I said. Peter, I want to go to Palestine and cover the elections. Now at the time, I have to tell you, I was writing about hairstyles and fashion. I was doing a little bit about politics, but I wasn't a war correspondent. I'd never been to the Middle East. I wasn't that kind of news correspondent journalist. No, I was writing about having children and moving to France and, you know, nice stuff. Why did I walk into that office? Well, luckily I can't tell you. And I can't tell you why my editor said, off you go, Laura, here's a check for your expenses, see you in two weeks. Dum, dum, dum. Two weeks later, I was standing outside Tel Aviv Airport on my own. All I had was three phone numbers from the Palestinian ambassador in London, a charming man called Afif Safia, who I said to him, do you know anyone in Palestine who I can speak to? He said, my dear, it's all fine. Here are three numbers, you'll be fine. <laughs> so I'm standing outside Tel Aviv airport going, what do I do now? And a man comes up to me. And Allah makes the right people come to you at the right time. And this man said to me, hi. My name is Jamal, but you can call me Jimmy. <laughs> I said, hi, Jimmy. He said, uh, do you need a taxi? I said, yeah. I want to go to somewhere called Ramallah. And this man, Jamal, took me all the way through Quds, all the way through what they call Israel, from Tel Aviv to Ramallah in just over an hour and a bit. And in 63 minutes, he gave me 63 years of Palestinian history all about the occupation. It was fascinating. I'm sure my, mate, my face was like this. I remember at one moment we came through Jerusalem and as we got closer to the Palestinian areas, the roads got worse, got bumpy. And I started to feel sick. I'm not a very good traveler. And I saw a lovely road on the hillside and I said to Jimmy Jamal, I said, brother, I don't want to tell you your job but can we please use that road? Because it's nice and flat and nobody's on it. He looked at me and said, you don't know much about this, do you? I said, no, tell me. He said, that road up there is a Jews only road. If I take you on that road in about six or seven minutes, we will be shot dead. Shall we go on that road? And he did a little tire spin like that. They have a very wicked sense of humor in Palestine. It's a bit of a joke to kind of freak out tourists, actually, I think. I said, no, 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 I don't want to go on that road. Jimmy Jamal explained to me that being Palestinian from Jerusalem, the joke was on him. Because his taxes paid for that Jews only road that he couldn't go on without being shot. One word came to my head, apartheid. Anyway, the next day, there I was in Ramallah, in the wild West Bank. I'd never been to the Arab world, and here I was, in like a TV movie. And I had secured my big interview with a man called Mahmoud Abbas, who was about to become the leader of the Palestinian Authority. Now, when you go to meet a world leader, you have to negotiate with their security. You have to do what the security says. If any of you want to go meet Obama now, believe me, you go through so much security. Well, of course. Palestinian leader also has security. So I was taken through a series of avenues of very tall, increasingly taller Arab men it seemed to me. And by the end I got to his personal guards, one six foot five Palestinian, one six foot eight Palestinian, both of them big guns. They ushered me into a metal lift. My handbag was taken and my phone was taken and I stood there just looking at these big movie villain baddies. And then they closed the metal doors and I remember one of the walkie-talkies went <laughs> and the man on my right, the giant, took it out and went inshallah. <laughs> I'm really sorry, that is how Arabic sounds to English people, in case you didn't know. 
I really want to ask about the volume control thing as well. What is that with Arabic? Does it have to be so loud? I remember at one point I was being driven through the West Bank and my driver leant out the door and said to a man, and I thought, whoa, it's going to be, there's going to be murder. My heart was pumping. I said, what's going on? He said, it's his birthday. I was standing in the lift. The giant with the gun had spoken into the walkie-talkie, and in my mind, the subtitle came up for the scene, We'll kill the white woman later. <laughs> and I realized that I had Arabophobia. That I had absorbed over years all of the negative viewpoints, all of the negative propaganda about Muslims, about Arabs, about Palestinians, and here I was, armed Arab, Muslim, Palestinians. I was scared. But you know what they say? A week is a long time in politics, right? Well, let me tell you, 72 hours is a very long time in Palestine. I want to remind you of a hadith, actually. There will always remain a group within my Ummah, said the Prophet, peace be upon him, fighting for the sake of Allah at the gates of Damascus and the area around it, and at the gates of Jerusalem and the area around it. They will not be affected by those who let them down victoriously, adhering to the truth until the last hour begins. Brothers and sisters, the land of Palestine is blessed for all people. And I went as an unbeliever and I felt the power of the land and the goodness of the people. And 72 hours after arriving in Palestine, I looked at myself in the mirror and I thought, I love these people. And I knew that I'd give my life for any child or any mother who asked me to look after them. Such was the love and the peace that I felt from the people there. I'll give you an example. The day after I met Mahmoud Abbas, I was walking through Ramallah and an old lady came up to me and she grabbed me by the sleeve and she looked at me and she was tiny, tiny. She said, yalla, yalla, yalla. And she just pulled me by the arm and I went with her into a house and she opened a wardrobe and she put a coat on me because I didn't have a coat and it was January and it was cold. And then she got out a little case, an old battered case, and she put some jumpers in. I don't know whose they were, but she wanted me to have them. And then she wrote her name and number on a bit of paper, and she ushered me into the street, and she said, Salam alaikum. I thought, what is this? Is this really possible in this day and age? It was just the first of so many incidences when I met with the ancient custom of generosity and kindness that is at the core of Islam. When Allah has a plan for you, you can't go left or right of that plan. You will arrive at the same destination that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has planned for you. So after that first visit, I was changed. But I wanted to get on with my life. Because my family was saying to me, don't get involved with Palestine, don't get involved, you've got a nice career. I mean, Palestine is a career killer. <laughs> yeah. Believe me, it's a career killer. Don't touch it. Ask the Democrats and the Republicans to talk to you about Palestine this week, I think you'll know what I mean. <laughs> Nobody touches it. So I came back and I told my husband, I had this feeling these people are amazing, it's terrible, they struggle. He said, don't touch it. You can talk about you. Don't touch it. But when Allah has a plan for you, you can't step away from that plan. And every time in the intervening years that I tried to even take a step away from the Palestinian question, I was put right in the center of something. In 2007, I got a phone call. It was from a man I'd never met called Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali is a very funny guy. He runs the Islam channel in England. He called me up and he said, we want to have a meeting with you. I didn't know why. I went to meet him with another executive and they offered me a job at the Islam channel. 
Now, the very fact that I bought wine during that meeting, which forced them to leave the restaurant while I drank the wine on my own, should have told them that I wasn't a Muslim. But Muhammad Ali said to me, we don't mind that you're not a Muslim. We want you at the Islam channel as a presenter. And what did that job do? That job in 2007 meant that I traveled the world interviewing some of the greatest academics, scholars and activists in the Islamic world today. I remember meeting one particular man and he was Sheikh Raid Saleh. Sheikh Raid Saleh is the Lion of Palestine. He is the leader of the Islamic movement in northern Israel and he is one of the guardians of Al-Aqsa Mosque and I met him in Copenhagen. And he walked up to me to do the interview something like this. This is the Lion of Palestine. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I thought, this is the Lion of Palestine? He's so quiet. He's so humble. He sat opposite me and only spoke in Arabic and I only speak English, but we recorded it, and it was going to be translated later. And I loved every word he said. There was such a power coming from this man. And I know now that it's called Iman. It came over me like a wave. And the other thing was this. Sheikh Raid Salah never looked me in the face during the whole interview. He mostly looked at his hands, and he had a small smile on his face, but his words were very vigorous. And I thought, what a lovely, polite, humble man. As a Western journalist, I'd been told subliminally that if an Arab man doesn't look you in the face, it's because he finds you disgusting. <laughs> they don't look you in the face because they want to vomit at the very idea of an infidel. He will be sick if he looks at you. You will have polluted his soul. But, when Sheikh Raid Salah didn't look at me, all I felt was respect for him. Because I knew that his soul, his mind was somewhere else. I didn't know at that time that it was moving towards Allah. That came later. Now, as I said, I wasn't looking for any spiritual journey. I was a happy sinner. I was making my own way. I was cracking on with life. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a plan for you, you will get dawa even if you don't want it. So I was getting dawa from 2005 to 2010 from a very surprising source. And it wasn't an academic source. It was from Somalian taxi drivers in North London. Somalian taxi drivers are the unthanked soldiers of Allah. Allah, he believed me. In every city of the world, right now, somebody who doesn't know Islam will be getting into a taxi and a Somalian taxi driver will be giving them a hadith. SubhanAllah, whether they want it or not. <laughs> I would get into these taxis and I'd say, Salam, because I've been to the West Bank, and they'd say, Salam Alaikum, as the Prophet said to his wife, Aisha, and we'd be off. <laughs> and I'd get a free 40 minute lecture. And you know what? I found that I really looked forward to these lectures. And one particular thing was happening. I was falling in love with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And this is one of the steps to coming to Islam. Your heart, first of all, must be softened. And then you must learn to love the Prophet. This is one of the steps. So I would sit in the back and I'd think, wow. That guy, Muhammad, sounds really amazing. I think I'd like to have met him. You know, these days, since being Muslim, sometimes I still get taxis, and they're driven by Somalians in North London. And as a sister, I will say, Salam Alaikum. And the brothers always have the same one question for me now, I'm Muslim. The same question. I say, Salam Alaikum, and they say, are you married? Are you married? Are you married? Are you married? 
amazing. I don't get any hadith or any Quran. I don't know what happened. Laugh. Lots of proposal. I'd like to tell you now how I got my first Quran. Would you like to hear? Yes. In 2007, I'd been back to the West Bank and I'd been back to Gaza. This time I was an activist. No messing about. You can't sit on the fence in this question. People often say to me, how do you say objective on the question of Palestine and Israel? Oh, come on, really? Desmond Tutu said it best. If an elephant is treading on the tail of a mouse, and you say to the mouse, I'm going to stay impartial in this question, don't expect the mouse to thank you. Desmond Tutu said that in relation to Palestine. So please don't ask me to be impartial, there's no such thing. So, I was leaving Gaza, and I'd seen some terrible things of what the occupation army did to the elderly there and the sick. Some very bad things, and I was very upset. I might say, maybe I was mildly traumatized. And this was my last day, and I was in Al-Quds, Jerusalem, and it was tipping down with rain, and I had 40 minutes till I was going to get interrogated at the airport, so I wasn't in a good mood, and I had souvenir shopping to do. Suddenly, a young man appeared next to me, and he did that thing that Palestinians do, since young Palestinian men do this. Marhaba! What is that? They do, they do, in the West Bank and Jerusalem, and Gaza, Marhaba! So I said, Marhaba. He said, can I help you? I said, look, brother, I, I've got to do some shopping, I'm in a hurry, and I've got a list of souvenirs. He said, let me help you. I said, okay. So I read the list of souvenirs, and it was this. Two toy camels for my daughters, a ceremonial knife for my husband, and a Quran in English. I was kind of interested. He looked at the list. He said, this is great. All of these men are my uncles. I shall take you into the shops, and we will get everything. So for the next 40 minutes, I went in and out of every shop along the souk in the old city. And I drank so much mint tea, I'm sure I got diabetes. <laughs> really, you have, too much, you have too much sugar in your tea. Stop it now. I'm not joking. 41 minutes later, I was standing back outside in the rain with everything in two bags and a lot more gifts beside. And I turned to the young man. Now this was a young man I'd never seen before and I would never ever see again. And I said to him, how much do I owe you? And he looked at me and said, this is a gift from the people of Palestine to you. Please don't forget us when you go. SubhanAllah. That's how I got my first Quran. It was a gift from the people of Palestine to a stranger. SubhanAllah. When Allah has a plan for you, you must go along with that plan. Now, so far, I've only talked about Palestine, but I want you to understand something, brothers and sisters. Allah <clears throat> sent me to Palestine, and the people of Palestine sent me to Allah. That's just how this story goes. In 2008, I was living in France. I had a swimming pool. I was a top-name journalist, and... I was absolutely committed to the freedom of Palestine. And I got an email, and it was very strange. And it was just two lines, but again, it would change my life forever. And it said, would you like to go to Gaza by boat? If so, call this number. In 2008, the siege of Gaza was already underway. That's 1.8 million men, women, and children denied their basic human rights by the state of Israel. Unable to move, going hungry, in terrible conditions. Would you like to go to Gaza by boat, call this number? Well, I called the number, of course I did. And a voice answered, and the voice said, hello, Osama here. I thought, blimey, I'm not going to Gaza with Osama. <laughs> It's the worst idea ever. But you know what? It was a different Osama. 
and I went to see my editor again and I said, again, I want to go to Gaza this time by boat. He said, here's a check, off you go. And I thought, he just wants to get rid of me. <laughs> in August 2008, I was in, um, I was in Cyprus with 46 of the bravest people I've ever met. How are you doing, youngster? <laughs> The people were called the Free Gaza Movement and they had bought two old boats in order to challenge the Israeli sea siege of the Gaza Strip. Now no one had ever gone by sea to Palestine in 44 years. Why? Because the last trip had been blown up by the Israelis and the people who wanted to do it had been assassinated in Cyprus and we were the next to try. It wasn't a joke but we were determined to do it. And on the 23rd of August 2008, the two little boats bobbed towards Gaza, and I heard the words, land ahoy. And there it was, Gaza rising out of the water. And as we got closer, we saw spots in the distance, and we realized there were people, tens of thousands of Palestinians, had slept on the beaches waiting for us to arrive because they couldn't believe that the world had finally come to see them. And as we got closer, a sound hit us, and it was this, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And then little boys were swimming up to the boats, and we pulled them onto the boats. We had so many children on the boats that we nearly sank before we got there. And it was the best day of my life. I ended up spending a month in Gaza. And that month, brothers and sisters, was Ramadan. And you cannot not be moved by being in Ramadan in Gaza. <coughs> These are the greatest people of the Ummah today. These are the oppressed people. Whenever I feel like I'm going to cry about what's happening in Gaza and Mullahi, we should all never stop crying for what is happening in Palestine. You shouldn't even be able to draw a breath as a Muslim without tearing your heart out for what is happening to our Ramah. But I tell myself don't cry because these are the people of Jannah. And in 2008, I was not a Muslim, I had my hair out and my arms showing and everybody in Gaza was lovely to me, even the men with the beards that touched their chin, touched their, uh, touched their chest. And I went to visit a family who were very poor. And this family was in a place called Rafa, the same place that Faris Ode came from. And do you see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works? In the year 2000, I was a journalist watching TV who had no interest in the Middle East and I saw a boy from Rafa throw a stone. And in 2008, I was in Rafa in Ramadan. And I had not made any of those decisions consciously. I took meat to a family in a very poor condition and I knocked on the broken door and the mother answered like this, And her smile the smile was so sweet. It was so beautiful and so full of light. I have never ever seen such a happy smile in my life. And I thought, surely behind that door can't be more poverty. Surely she must have hidden wealth because nobody could be that happy and have nothing. It's bad enough that the whole area is riddled with bullet holes and I can hear tanks. She can't be poor, she can't be. And I walked past her and I walked into an empty room, a tiny cement room with nothing in it at all, except for some old mattresses around the walls that would be pulled down at night and 19 people would sleep on in one single room. And the iftar that the mother had prepared for her children, her many children, was this, iftar bit of bread and some leaves, salad leaves, and a bit of hummus, that was it. And I felt really angry. For the first time since working in the Muslim community, 
I felt anger at Islam and Allah. And I said to this mother, I said, why do you fast in Ramadan? I don't get it. You are all saying here in Gaza, Allah loves us, Allah loves us, but you're going hungry for 17 hours a day. Why? You're hungry the whole year. You're not drinking any water for 17 hours a day, so what? You only have filthy water the whole year. Why do you fast in Ramadan? Why? And this mother of Rafa looked at me and she said, I fast in Ramadan to remember the poor. SubhanAllah. I fast in Ramadan to remember the poor. This woman who had nothing of any, any worth in dunya at all wanted to humble herself before her maker because she wanted to remember those who were worse off than her who was worse off than her. She didn't see it because that night a stranger had brought her meat so she said Alhamdulillah and at that moment a key went into my heart and a very clear thought came to me if this is Islam I'm in if this humility when you already are humbled is Islam I'm in if this kindness to a stranger is Islam I'm in if this respect for others and love for your God is Islam I want to be Muslim but that's not what happened because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us quite rightly in the Quran the forgetful mankind he says you forget you are forgetful and guess what happened I said salam alaikum closed the door on her little wrecked home and I forgot about the feeling and I got on with sinning and I got on with my life and I forgot about Allah brothers and sisters please consider this tonight in the intervening years Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never forgot about me he did not let me go without calling me back this is our Rahman our Rahim this is the caller to all of you here no matter how far you go from your deen Allah is there calling you back this is mercy subhanallah in 2009 I went back to Gaza after the devastation of Operation Cast Lead and it seems that I had another lesson to learn this time I visited the Samuni family 46 members of the Samuni family died F-16 rockets, white phosphorus hit their homes by the time I arrived it was smoking rubble and there was a woman sitting on the rubble and I went up to her and I said salam alaikum and she said a word sisters it broke my heart this mother was sitting on the rubble of her home and she stood up and she said Fadal welcome and she tried to look for a chair for her guest and she said to me I'm sorry I'm not sure I can make you tea and she felt ashamed not to be able to look after her guest on the rubble of her smoking home subhanallah she said would you like to meet my sons I said yes I would and I expected they'd be one of the snotty barefooted children running around but she looked in a bag and she took out a picture and there were three beautiful boys and the only thing wrong with them was that each one had a bullet hole in their chest the Israelis had executed them four, three and one and a half years old and this mother said to me Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah it was the next year in 2010 that I went to another Muslim city and I reported on the Jerusalem Day March and on my day off I went past another masjid and it was Ramadan again and this time I pulled on a shador and I made wudu before I went into the masjid in Ramadan and I made a little prayer and this time I prayed to Allah not to God 
And I remember saying, Dear Allah, I don't need anything from you. Please just bless Palestine. And then I sat down and I was ready to watch all the kids playing and the mothers feeding their children. But that's not what happened. When I sat down, it was as if I was under a waterfall of peace. An absolute sea of tranquility descended on me. I was at such peace that I couldn't even remember my name and I didn't think I existed anymore. I was just a tiny atom in a whole universe of peace and I knew that the universe is made on love and that all of the problems in the world we make, that we're responsible for them. And if you had that feeling, brothers and sisters, you would never ever want to move again. So I didn't move. I just stayed like this, sitting on the floor for a long time. Finally, my friend said to me, we should go now. And I said, nah, I'm going to sleep here on the floor tonight. I did not want to let go of that feeling. And the next morning I prayed Fajr. And then I went outside the masjid. And it was dawn and I took a breath and then, and then the panic set in. Or we can say Shaitan then started his whispering because the thoughts just came tumbling into my head. You can't be Muslim, you're not like them, you can't wear hijab, you're not like that, you can't give up drinking, stop eating pork, you're not that sort of person, you don't know about God, you don't know about Moses, you don't know, and I was having a panic attack. I've never been so afraid in my life. If you can imagine going from a secular Christianity <coughs> to full and absolute knowledge that Allah is God, Muhammad is his messenger, the books are real, heaven is real, hell is real, and the day of judgment is real, and you've realized that all in one night, then you know fear. But a voice came to me in my head and said, don't worry, it's going to be fine. Just carry on with your life, you're going to be okay. And I did get on with my life, with one exception, every three hours I wanted to pray after that. I wanted to make sujood and I wanted to say sorry to Allah. And seven days later I walked into a masjid in London and I said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, and I became Muslim. Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! And that's how I come to be standing in front of you in a hijab and an abaya. And I am immensely grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing me to be here. And I ask your forgiveness for any errors I may have made this morning, this evening, or any way I've misled you. And all praise is for Allah. Assalamu alaikum How many of you enjoyed that story? How many of you know that it touched your heart and made you proud to be a Muslim? Alhamdulillah. Allah gives us the opportunity to make a difference in our circle of influence and look the power we have when we practice our Islam. Tonight we should be proud to be a Muslim. Tonight we should be proud that we came out and we were part of this program. And tonight I want to invite you to stay a few more minutes and ask questions of Sister Lauren, if you have any. And she will be happy to share with you anything that she left out of her story. <laughs> We're not to the question yet. Okay. He, he went first. Did oh. you hear his question? <laughs> no. Anybody like his question? Yes. This, is, this is our representative, Salam Omani, for uh, the, the office in Houston. He's here to serve the community, work with the community, educate the community, do legal clinics. He is here to be an asset to Houston. And you know what he asked me? He said, I want to ask the first question. You know what he asked? Ask him for 200 more hours. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. 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 Inshallah. Anybody uh, want to make a donation? Again, please raise your hand. Say, I feel good about what happened tonight, and I'm going to give because Allah 
has moved me to do that tonight. Anybody? I'm not going to ask you. Just raise your hand. I don't care about the amount, but I'm going to get something. More than I've already said. It's a beer. Anybody else? Come to me. What I want to do now is to invite Sister Lauren to come up and let her do her own question and answer. So you can raise your hand, ask the question, and she'll be happy to answer. Sister Lauren, go ahead. Okay, so as long as these aren't maths questions, because I'm really bad at maths, as my daughter knows. Yes, brother. So, I'll, this is beautiful, what you said. It touched my heart. Um, I was going to ask you, uh, you still have your name as uh, Sister Lauren, as Lauren Booth, I believe, right? Did you, do you have a Muslim name? You know, uh, it's not uh, fucked. You don't have to change your name unless it's offensive to Islam. But I should let you all know that my name that I was born with is Sarah. And Sarah is the wife of Ibrahim. And Alhamdulillah, actually, uh, Sarah is the only female name to appear in the Torah, the Injil, and the Quran. So it's a really great name. So you can all call me Sarah if you wish, inshallah. <laughs> yes, brother. Uh, sister, first we want to welcome you to Islam. you got a zillion brother and sister now. And we're part of you. Uh, second, you've touched our heart about Palestine and Gaza and all that. I wonder if you have been watching the news about Syria and what's going on in Syria. And we're just wondering how come the national community not being uh, supportive of what's going on. Uh, it's an answer. Uh, we don't have a question for it yet. Um, Bismillah. You know, um, I've got a, the quote here was about Sham at the beginning. Did you yeah. not hear? The gates of Damascus and around it. We are all aware that some uprising, Allah Alam, is happening. And we love our brothers and sisters in Syria. And we all make the art for them. And when you say the international community, remember the Ummah is donating and is making du'a and is impacting inshallah uh, in a good way for the people of Syria. But the politicians, who knows what they gave us. So we pray for Sham. We pray for the people of Sham. So um, how did my daughters and my mother react to me becoming Muslim? Well, you've seen that, uh, Alex. She loves to go it's fine. Um, so when I came back from my experience in the masjid, and my daughters were eight and ten, I said, I'm thinking about becoming Muslim. What do you think? And being girls, they said, we're going to make a list of questions. And they went to make questions, and they came back. And Holly said, question one, if you're a Muslim, will you still be my mummy? <laughs> I think she thought it was a place you go to and don't come back. I said, yeah, I'll be your mummy. In fact, I'm sure I'll be a better mummy. Question number two. When you are a Muslim, will you still drink alcohol? I said, if I'm Muslim, I'll never touch alcohol again. And Holly and Alex said, hooray! Question number three, when you're a Muslim, will you still show your chest to my teachers? I said, sorry? <laughs> Holly said, you always have low cut tops on, and my teachers, some of them are men, and they can see you, and I want you to stop it. I said, you know what, listen Holly, if I'm a Muslim, I'm going to be modest from head to toe every time I leave the house. And she said, we love Islam! <laughs> But do you see how children naturally are pulled towards the benefits of Islam? They want a mother to be the center of the family. They want you to be within the freedoms and the goodness of Islam and not to do the haram. And they want you to be modest in your behavior and your clothing. They get this. How about Amazing. husband? Yes, this is Alex. This is Alexandra. She's very shy, so she won't say anything. How about your husband? How My husband, I was divorced before I came to Islam. And what everybody wants to know is what did Tony Blair say, right? Come on, be honest, my brothers and sisters. Um, look, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I haven't spoken to Tony Blair since the invasion of Afghanistan. And at that point, I called for him to resign as Prime Minister. And it's funny, but leaders have a real sense of humor loss about family members calling for them to resign in public. 
So I haven't spoken to him since 2001, and frankly, he's a murderer, and I think he's a war criminal, and he should be tried in the Hague. And uh, inshallah, Allah, Allah will do justice as He always does, or He will allow him to come to Islam. Both of the results. Alhamdulillah. And my mother. Now my mother is an Islamophobe. She is the kind of woman who thinks that Fox News is too kind to Muslims. And that we're all much crazier than that. So when I told her about my experience in the mosque, she cried. And I was amazed. And she said, whatever you want, I'm with you. And I thought, subhanAllah, Allah can do anything. Now we know that Allah created the universe and handles the affairs of creation every single minute, but to move my mother's heart, that's impressive. <laughs> so the next week I saw her and I had a scarf on and she said, what are you wearing that for? And I said, because I'm a Muslim. And my mom said, I thought you said Buddhist. <laughs> she wasn't happy. But you know what? I've discovered what being a daughter is thanks to Islam. And I wasn't a good daughter before Islam. And I've written her letters. I've been to see her. We spend more time together. And I try to look after her in a good way. And two years later, my mother now thinks that Islam is for terrorists who love their mothers. <laughs> so we're really making inroads. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes, sir. I have a question. You started your speech by saying that you were nervous about the community. And I understand it's, it's more about what we have seen yes. tonight. But what can you tell the community in the United States as Muslims? What are our responsibilities? And please be open to that. Don't say be open. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <laughs> There is a lady called Afia Siddiqui and she is serving 86 years in a prison in America for a crime it's not possible that she committed. Uh, a tiny seven stone woman was supposed to have attacked two American soldiers when what actually happened was she served three to four years in background. At one point she was tortured so badly, her screams were so awful that the other prisoners in Bagram went on hunger strike until the Americans stopped torturing her. This is our sister and she's in an American prison. How many times have you been outside the White House calling for her to be released? Anyone? Sorry, really? Seriously? I don't know what to say. SubhanAllah. Except for this, two weeks ago I was in Pakistan with Fauzia Siddiqui, who is Afia's sister. And she told me of the dreams that Afia has. And a year ago was the last time the family had contact with our sister Afia. And then her mother was sobbing and crying. Can you imagine her daughter's being raped and beaten? One of her grandchildren has been disappeared. The horrors go on and on, even now to this day. And her mother was crying, and Afia Siddiqui said, Mom, don't cry, I'm happy. She said, how can you be happy or present? She said, every night in my dreams, I see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he has even introduced me to his wife Aisha with the words, my dear wife, this is our daughter Afia. Her recent dream was this that she was with the Prophet وسلم, and she said to him, I'm tired. I find this test hard, can it stop now? And the Prophet said to our sister Afia, this was never your test. It's a test of the Ummah. SubhanAllah. I would like the American Ummah tonight to take this away. Be unified. Fear Allah, do not fear Firaun. If there are bad laws being committed on your society, don't say, what shall I say not to be arrested? Say, how do I change that law? If somebody in your community is taken and accused of terrorism and you know that they are a good brother or sister and a good family, don't say, I'm going to stay at home because I have to look after my family. Say, I'm Muslim, 
I will take that family food and I will be of benefit to that family. That's all I have to say on that. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa I would like, yes, but I like the amount of I would say that, you know, for this system, support was the legal fund. And to be on your side, you deserve every support. And you deserve every support. Thank you so much. We want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. We want to close with the Imam. And uh, inshallah, uh, we hope to uh, begin more programming with this community have opportunities to come and share with you the work we're doing, provide the financial services. Please walk through, uh, work with our representative, Salah Mahani, and I'll give the shake uh, 